to Robin Minds. My name is Isabella Adediji. A happy Easter celebration or happy Resurrection Sunday to those who practice the Christian faith. Now, we're going to start the show looking at an incident that happened over the week. Now, did you know that an estimated 1.3 billion people are living with disabilities? That's about 16% of the population of the world. That's one in six people are living with some form of disability. Yet, these people are excluded from employment, excluded from transportation services, excluded from contributing their own quota to society, to development. Um, they battle with stigma. A lot of times, people living with disability do not want to come out because they fear that they won't be given a chance or they'll be singled out, they'll be bullied. And when I mentioned an incident um, that happened over the course of the week, I'm referring to Debola Daniel, who posted on his ex account, narrating his ordeal at one of the popular quick service restaurants at the Murtala Mohammed International Airport. And he and his family wanted to purchase a meal, but he was excluded from gaining entrance to the facility. Um, they said no wheelchairs allowed. Um, and as a result, um, he wasn't served. He wasn't granted access. He left. And later on, his um, traveling company, um, his traveling party, returned to this quick service restaurant. And they still reiterated, the manager, which was caught on video, reiterated, no wheelchairs allowed. So now we're looking at ability and disability. Um, thankfully, FAN has responded very swiftly and they've closed down the um, facility but the wider conversation still remains um, why aren't people living with disabilities granted the opportunity to enjoy life to contribute to life and i'm glad that we have um, two guests here on the show joining us first we have the first blind or visually impaired african rapper He's also a voice actor and disability rights advocate, Abednego Norris. Welcome to Robin Minds. Thank you so much for having me. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, Nigeria and the world at large. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. And we also have um, joining us via Zoom, Olajide Funsho Benjamin, the executive director, Disability Not a Barrier Initiative, that's Dinabi, Nigeria. And he's also a disability rights advocate. Um, welcome, Olajide, to Robin Minds. So I'd like to start so um, the much. conversation looking at um, personal experiences. Um, it's always good to hear from people who are living with disabilities but have found a way to still um, exercise their abilities. So I'll start with you, Abednego. You are a rapper, you're a voice advocate, a voice actor, and a disability rights advocate. Um, what has been the experience um, charting a career despite your visual impairment? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, beautiful question. So I would start by saying it's 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 been a roller coaster of both good and bad moments remember as a person with disability you're struggling with quite a number of things the industry that i am in which happens to be the entertainment industry you'll find out that for people to put you on is a lot of work the the even when you show your workings that okay i can deliver they are unsure okay will this person do it up to my standard Will this person be able to give me what I want? Even when they can see that, okay, you've been doing this from a very, very long time up until this time. I mean, I represent an organization like Just Able Creative Expressions Africa. And one of the cores that we are championing is making sure that inclusion is readily available from the entertainment sector to sports and everything at large. As a voice actor, I believe that in conversations that have to do with voice actors, I wouldn't be in your mind immediately. But why is that? That's because you are unsure that I will be able to deliver. As a rapper, yes, I have been accepted more in that field. That's because um, there are no rappers that are doing such. 
uh, Cobhams is doing more of the singing and production alongside other things. And so for me to do something as new as this, it's uh, marveling. However, the support is not so 100 when it comes to, okay, get me reposted, get those support. And we need those things to fly because we also want to be part of the game-changing industry and say, this is our contribution to the quota and all. Mm. Thank you for that. I'll uh, move to Olajide Funsho. Um, Olajide, are you there? I'd like you to um, share a personal experience. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and good, good afternoon, afternoon. Of you viewers at home. Uh, of course, uh, my own experience has been that of a good and bad. Uh, good in the sense that uh, I actually had a father who had this uh, very serious trust in me, who believed so much in me. And that gave me uh, some level of privileges. Uh, for instance, the ability to be able to go well, to school at all was simply because my dad had this belief in me. And that was why I said that. And that was why I said that, uh, you know, a little bit good in that aspect. But uh, the bad aspect is this is our society, of course. Uh, when you look at the society that we live in, and then uh, you have this uh, cultural belief that persons with disabilities are good for nothing people, you know. And uh, considering the age when I was growing up, uh, the belief then was that the moment you are a person with disability, they have written you up straight. So just forget about it. You are not expected to become anybody in life. So, and then, uh, you know, growing up, uh, in a state like a state, you know, uh, a little bit uh, local in nature, and had to grow up there, uh, it was tough. Going to school was tough. Most of the classes, uh, you know, were trusty, inaccessible. Uh, they, uh, unlike now that you have so many uh, assistive devices that can support you in your career, then there was nothing of such, nothing like a purchase for me then. You know, I had this, my brother, who had to go into the bush and cut uh, a wood for me that I used to work then. So it was so tough. And, you know, looking back at uh, the issue of discrimination, the issue of rejection, even from family members. So it was seriously tough. I, I, I wouldn't wish that for anyone. anyone. Serious. I wouldn't. For Thank course, you for we'd sharing go. that. Um, I'll move to you, Abednego. Um, let's talk about access. Um, access to venues, for example, you're a rapper and in the course of your career, you'd have to perform on stage, you have to go to different venues. Um, how would you rate the kind of access that exists in the buildings in terms of um, them being inclusive for people living with disabilities? First, let me give a special shout to Adeni Kewiyetunde, who um, currently works a lot more with the Lagos state government and they're making sure that things like this are put in place. However, we're not there yet, 100. There are just uh, some of the major places that are making sure that when you're getting into the place, that you have a place where you can actually pass through. But it's not specifically for you, um, to be honest. So when shows are done, they are not putting you into the uh, quota or whatever they're planning. The only reason why I don't feel so much hurt about it half the time is because I have people who are going with me. But what about my next brother? What about my sister? You had uh, Olajide talk about how someone had to cut a wood for him to use as a cane guide. Now, if I don't have access to maybe living in Lagos or have more information like I do, what would it be like? It would, it would be a lot more difficult. So I think the, the, there's a lot more work to be done, but I would give, if I'm being honest, I would give some of the venues in Lagos, because not all of them, I'll give the venues in total a 5 over 10, which means more work needs to be done. Orientation is key. Um, continuation of these conversations and also factoring persons like us when we're coming to your event. You, it's one thing to say, oh, you're doing it because of your um, kindness part of you. And it's another thing to know that, okay, this is part of the law. So if we add kindness and doing the part of the law, then that would get us a 9 or most likely a 10 over 10. Yeah, a lot of... Um work has been done by the Lagos State Government um, in ensuring that some of these venues are accessible. Um, I'll move to you now, Olajide. And my question to you is looking at um, the government. 
when we look at some of the policies in place now on a federal level, because you made mention of Ekiti State, for example, um, do you feel that there are enough policies that are addressing some of the unique challenges faced by persons living with disabilities? All right, thank you. I, I think I would say that we have enough uh, policies and legal frameworks. To be candid, I would say that we have it. For instance, uh, Nigeria is signatory to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and uh, Nigeria is also signatory to the African uh, Disability Protocol. And then uh, in 2018 also, uh, the then president of Nigeria, President Muhammadu Buhari, also signed the Discrimination Against Persons with Disabilities Prohibition Act uh, 2018 into, into an act. And uh, various uh, states in Nigeria have also domesticated uh, this uh, act. For instance, Ekiti State have domesticated, uh, domesticated it into law. So, and we have uh, several other policies, inclusive education policy, uh, the national health policy, and, and all the rest of them. But of course, uh, it is not just peculiar to uh, disabilities alone. Virtually all uh, laws and legal frameworks and policy frameworks in Nigeria, the usual problem that we usually have has always been the aspect of implementation. So, and I think that is what is still lacking now uh, as far as the disability community is concerned. Uh, you know, talking about the uh, issue of accessibility that you raised the other time, of course, it was this year that uh, the, 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 uh, the moratorium given in that law uh, came to an end. For instance, in the, in the Act, we have a moratorium of five years that every public building must conform, must ensure that they have accessibility facilities put in place which means that after the five years, they can't be sued now, all right? And uh, uh, of course, it now depends on if the duty bearers are ready enough, especially the National Commission for Persons with Disabilities, which is also a subset of that particular act, because its, uh, it's creation is as a result of uh, a, a section in that act. So, and of course, we are expecting now that people will now begin to come out and, and let, uh, let, let, let me just inform you that uh, uh, the word public building in that act is not talking about government buildings alone. It's talking about every building that are made in such a way that people within the society can have access to them. So buildings so that, that are opening accessible by the now, public. It, it, is, it has become a public building. Because it means that you are going to be rendering services and you are expecting people to be coming uh, in, into such facilities. Mm -hmm. So uh, for me, we have various laws, we have various policies, but the aspect of implementation, to me, it's very, very slow, extremely slow, which is so, not so good enough. Looking... And I believe that government can do better. Okay, so it's more about the enforcement of... Um, and implementation of these laws. Now, I want to move the conversation, um, Abednego, to the role of education, the role of the media mm -hmm. in sensitizing um, the population that people living with disabilities have abilities. They should be included. In your own view, do you feel that the education system and also the media is doing enough to promote inclusion and to educate um, the population on because when we look at um, people living with disabilities it's quite a wide spectrum from uh, mental health issues to physical issues yeah. and um, even albinism mm -hmm. okay so to be uh, fair i would say education wise we are not there yet we're not there at all so it is one thing to say, hey, come to my school, come school with us. We're going to offer you admission. It is another thing to say, when you get here, you are on your own. It is like I said, there is the kindness part that people are thinking, oh, that's the law working. No, that's not the law working. We have a lot of work to do. If you check out a visually impaired person now, how many of our universities have libraries that have books that we can use? Because what they have had to do is say to you, when you get your notes or something of sort, then bring it over to us. We would now find a way to have them embossed for you. 
And imagine your exam is in a month's time, but this process sometimes takes up to two to three months. Haven't you written the exams already? So enough work needs to be done when it comes to putting more books in the libraries that are in maybe Braille or more, more sign interpreters for people who are um, living with hearing impairment and the likes. We have to do these things because it has not been done. When it comes to the media, the issue here is the media has not done enough. If you talk about starting from having more programs that educate people on these issues, we don't have them so many. I can count them with my fingers that, okay, these are the number of TV or radio stations that are offering programs of sort to talk about these issues, maybe weekly and things like that. That's on one hand. On the other hand, how many ads are running to educate you on certain issues? In Lagos, for instance, I see that it is the Lagos State radio stations that are running one or two of those ads, or maybe three at most. You know, we don't just want the media and the education sector to see us as, okay, let it not be that you did not get an opportunity to be here. We need these things fixed. Are we, if you're in school, are you filling a form that says, oh, some things that you might need, some things that you should be aware of? More scholarship schemes need to come up. For the media itself, um, we have persons with disabilities that want to really work, even behind the scenes, in front of the cameras, in front of the mics. How many jobs are available? I remember an incident that happened to me personally. I mean, it's, it's definitely fine now because it's been gone, and I know it will definitely work someday. But I remember a radio station where I had done great. And at that time, rather than retaining me, the excuse was, oh, you were still in school, but we have people who are making these things happen. That's a discrimination on its own. Also, we want to be able to join normal conversations in the media, not just disability conversations that mm. we're going to be joining in. Now, I'm here because this is a disability conversation. If you're having an issue of, of maybe talking about a buju or maybe a normal Nigerian issue, I should be able to get that call that says, hey, we need you to jump on this conversation as well. If that's not happening, if jobs are not happening also where they say, oh, it's this visually impaired guy, it's this lady with albinism or this person that is um, the sign interpreter on here, then I think we're just only joking. Mm. So you don't want it to just be a tokenistic approach where... Um, certain people living with disabilities are only given a chance when it comes to the disability itself, that conversation, but they should be allowed to contribute their quota irregardless of um, whatever disabilities they're living with. Um, Olajide, I'd like you to weigh in on that. Um, what are your views when it comes to what the media should be doing, what the education system um, should be doing? In your experience, were you supported um, um, growing up, um, attending schools, um, what kind of help was available? Olaj Day? Okay, while we're just waiting for um, the connection to be restored, I'll move to you, Abednego. Um, we've talked about the challenges. Um, right now, what are some short-term solutions? What are some things that need to be done so that we can move the needle further? Okay, so um, like the team which I'm a part of, which is just able to creative expression to Africa. What we intend to do and have started doing in the past and even up until now is we should start by educating people. Do you get orientation needs to be done. Mm. It begins with me and you. If I say, hey, um, Isabella, rather than call me this, can you call me that? You've learned a thing, which means I'm hoping that you teach a person or two how to say it. And then it's, it's going to spread that way. If, it's, if it comes to the education um, sector, we should not just give um, these courses alone and say, come and study this course. We should also make it work. Where the roads that people are, uh, that persons with disabilities are a part of, make sure that there are ramps, make sure that the gutters are covered. If it comes to the media itself as well, we should also champion these conversations, fix these ads to play on radio and TV, talking about why you shouldn't discriminate, what to do better. I, I, I mean, the transportation system too needs to get better. I've gotten in a bus and things like that where someone is saying to me, who go pay? Who's supposed to pay? I, I, he, I got on your bus because I'm obviously paying. Mm. And then you're asking that question. So that's discriminatory. We need to start having these conversations more. It starts with maybe people saying, hey, can we organize something where we have all the drivers or teachers or lecturers or people in media from the most senior ones and say, hey, can we come together and get orientated by these people while we also tell them why certain things can work we also have to begin to 
ask, okay, would you be interested before canceling uh, these people out? I think these are some of the short-term conversations. Then from time to time, have these conversations, not only when an issue like Debola has happened, that we're going to have it, or maybe we're having this conversation so that it doesn't look like it. Maybe once in three months or something, if every radio and TV station says this is what's going to happen, then cool, giving opportunities where it is due, not just in um, the disability world. I'm a voice actor, for instance. You would not expect to say, hey, only when there are um, adverts that has to do with disabled persons that you will reach out, or only events for disabled persons for him to host. No, you are reaching out because you believe in Italian, talent, you believe I would deliver, or to um, wrap at your event, not just from the disability angle, but because, yes, truly, I will. so we want to be given those platforms, then more scholarship schemes have to be created for persons with disabilities and uh, the likes. There are many more things, but since these are short terms to begin with, then I think we can start from here. Mm, mainstreaming that conversation, and it's not just a reactive approach, but um, you're proactive in ensuring that people are aware. Um, I like the example you gave, because a lot of times they say disabled people, but um, when you're orientated, you know that it's persons living with disabilities or persons with disabilities, and the media does have a role to play. Um, Olajide, are you there? Olajide? Okay. Um, hopefully... Yes, I'm here. Okay, great. Okay, I'd like you now to speak. Yes, 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 I can hear you. Okay, please go ahead. Olajide, please go ahead and make your contribution. Can you come again, please? Okay, I'm asking, um, I'm not sure if you heard the first question, but let's just go off the last question, which is what are some of the things that can be done in the short term to address this issue? So we don't have the situations keep occurring where persons living with disabilities are excluded. Oh, all right. Uh, th thank you. I, I think uh, just like uh, my colleague had, had just said, I think it is important that we continue to create uh, more awareness uh, around uh, especially the Disability Act. Uh, I, sometimes I do not uh, necessarily blame people uh, that uh, this against uh, persons with disabilities because some of them they have this uh, cultural belief that have been with them right from uh, you know uh, their childhood days and what they have seen from their parents and from their grandparents and you know they were still practicing that so sometimes I do not necessarily blame them uh, but, uh, but of course I, I think uh, there is a need for us now to continue to sensitize them to continue to uh, let them know that uh, uh, it is no longer business as usual. We are no longer in the 19th or the 18th century, that things have changed. Uh, of course, now, I think some of those things that I'm expecting now is for government to be proactive. Uh, just like uh, what Abednego uh, said, that uh, you know, uh, it's not only when it has to do with disability issues that persons with disabilities should be invited. There are other areas. For instance, I studied computer engineering. I'm an IT consultant, which means that I am expected to be practicing. But uh, in a situation whereby it was only when it has to do with disability issues that I'm being called upon. Uh, yes, I am a disability rights advocate, and then uh, I practice it fully as well. So, but uh, of course, who said that I cannot, uh, you know, act and perform as a commissioner? Uh, for science and technology in my state, because I have the prerequisite qualifications. So, but uh, our society has been designed in such a way that uh, uh, they, be, they still have this notion, this traditional belief that uh, uh, it has to just to be about disability alone. So the orientation, that awareness creation has to be deepened, has to be deepened. And even persons with disabilities, we ourselves also need to, uh, you know, learn more about our own issues. We need to learn more. Even in this uh, Disability Act, some of us still need to, you know, build our capacity so that we'll be able, we, we are the one that should begin to, uh, you know, sensitize the general public. As, as our organizations, we have trained the media, we have trained uh, uh, the uh, uh, the Nigerian Security and Civil Defense Corps, and I
I think this is where it starts. And others can continue to, you know, train others like that. And the more Definitely. we are doing this, uh, the more the society continues to get better and better for uh, persons with disabilities. Thank you very much, Olajide. I think on that note, um, uh, a summary could be that all hands need to put on deck, all hands need to be on deck to drive that conversation on inclusion. And the government has a place to play, the media as well as the education system. Um, that's where we're going to wrap up the conversation. Thank you very much, Abednego Norris, for being our guest here on Robbie Minds. And we hope to see you another time when disability is not the conversation. Maybe oh, yes, entertainment definitely, definitely. When, when you reach out, something we'll to make do it happen. With, yes, yes um, we, will, we will. To do with the entertainment industry. And thank you very much, Olajide Funsha Benjamin, for joining us. We'll take a quick break on Robbie Minds. Don't go anywhere. Don't you, don't you stand teasing me. Now it's time. You just heard Coca by Kanika Kapoor featuring We Are Sean. Coca, Coca. Welcome, Kanika Kapoor, to, um, to Robin Minds. Thank you. Um, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'll still. Coca, Coca, Coca. Okay, tell me, let's go back to the very beginning. Your musical influences growing up, the inspiration. How did it all start? And when did you get to that point you decided music is it for me? Uh, I grew up in the north of India, uh, in, a, in, a, in a, the cultural capital uh, of, uh, of India called Lucknow. And uh, I moved to London almost 25 years ago. So I lived in India where I studied music. And um, I remember that moment where I was, I used to be the head of the choir and in my school. And, and I used to sing a lot and I used to participate in competitions. So I studied and did my master's in music. And I was sort of moving more towards that. Um, that's how music started. Um, okay, so what influences did you draw, say, from that mixed background? Because the north of India and in a, a city like London, yes. um, what, um, what, um, what inspired your decision? Uh, do, do you have any specific musical artist that played a huge role in becoming a musician? I wouldn't say a musical artist, but I think my guru, my teacher, he was a very, very senior uh, artist and a, and a classical singer um, of his times, um, but very, very traditional classical, you know, from the famous Bar Banaras Gharana, as we call it, the, the school of music. Um, and uh, I was very inspired by him, but because I moved to London at a very mm. young age, I was a teenager, I um, almost sort of got the best of both the worlds, the East and the West and, you know, the culture, which is why a lot of my music and actually most of my music is very, very fusion between mm. India and the rest of the world. And, and now with Coca, I, yes. I was getting some Afro beats in there. So yes. We're, yes. we're seeing that fusion continue. Um, in becoming um, an artist, what are some challenges that you faced in doing this fusion music? Because a lot of times when we hear Indian music, it's very in its purest form. We know it from the movies, yes. the dancing, and then now you're fusing that with obviously your experience in London. And now we'll still come back to the Nigeria conversation, but I'd just like to know whether you faced any challenges, any questions, um, what was the, the initial reactions? You know, I mean, the, the reason that I got success was because I brought my own style and my own sound and my own fusion. Um, I started my career in London with, with a small uh, green screen video on YouTube and it went viral. It was my vocals with, with uh, a, a, a rapper from the UK, you know, and that became fire. And it was for, it was the first time it was ever done like that, which is because of that, I got Bollywood movie offers and they asked me to come and replicate that style of music and singing and production in India. And that became a whole new sound in Bollywood, um, which was going very, very strong over the years. And I think it's just become the Kanika Kapoor sound. Um, 
And then now I feel that I'm, you know, bringing in yet another sound, which is Afrobeat and uh, and the Indian hook lines. It it is my style. What what you listen to and what you will be listening to. Um, it's it's something that um, you know is my style of music. I wouldn't even say that. So if staying true to your sound, your yes. influences, yes. that fusion yes. has opened lots of opportunities. So um, what made you go into um, the fusion between your music, Indian music, your cultural background and Afrobeats? So the last few years, I would say Afrobeat started, you know, you know, growing its fire. In, in India, and uh, I remember going to a cafe or to a club or to a party, and wherever I would go, there was an, a bit of Afrobeat. Um, and then it became more and more and more, and right now, it's, it's, it's really huge. I think the sound of, uh, you know, Afrobeat, Nama Piano, and, you know, East African music, any, obviously, they don't know the difference over there, but mm. they love the whole sound. But they don't know the artists. They don't know the singers or the producers or where it's coming from. They just like the sound. Mm. I moved to Nigeria um, after getting married. So becoming the Niger wife, the official Niger <laughs> wife, I thought it would be best for me to sort of do a collaboration which takes the most amazing artists and the sound, sound of Nigeria, which is also my country now, uh, and mix it with India. And uh, that's how it's come together. Okay. I'm doing doing exactly what was a success story of Kanika Kapoor back in the UK. So I'm doing that again. Yeah, with Nigeria. replicating it here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, tell me about this. Um, your new home. Like, how has Nigeria been for you? Um, what what has been your experience so far living in Lagos and being a Niger wife? Um, so it's been coming up to three years where uh, I've been in and out of the country and uh, been spending a lot of time here last two years since I got married. Um, it's, it was a bit of a shock when I moved because suddenly from having this huge career in India, in, in the UK, and uh, you know, almost not knowing anybody in this country, uh, making friends, making you know, work colleagues, getting into uh, doing what I do best here. I set up a studio. Uh, I I was very lucky that I met uh, a, a very famous artist who actually helped me in bringing together my studio and uh, introduced me to a, a a producer, who then brought in artists and it went on and on. And I have made some beautiful uh, relationships here. I now have a, a Nigerian manager who looks after work with me. We work together. Uh, I have my own team here, so it's. I think I've settled in pretty well, and I'm enjoying uh, life here. It's 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 a lot like India. Mm, okay. Well, what about the food? Um, is it spicy? How are you uh, coping with that? I love the Lagos chili. It's the first time I ever tried Lagos chili was here. I'd never had anything like it. Um, I've tried bits and pieces of everything. Uh, I, I I eat more vegetarian food, so I haven't explored so much mm. uh, but i'm enjoying it and there's a huge community indian community here um in lagos and mm. i know in different parts of um, nigeria but i want to go back to the music now you mentioned um afro beats do you have any particular artists that you say for those people in india they might not have the same context you have as living in nigeria so you get to know the names of the artists the songs yes. the genres yes. the sub genres so any particular um afrobeat artist that you've been inspired from or has um, influenced your sound i wouldn't say i I've, I've not reached that place where i've been influenced by a particular sound i just love i'm still learning the difference between the different sounds of Afrobeat. And I, and I love, the more I learn, the more I want to learn. Um, so I'm overall inspired by the beat and, and the different techniques of it. And actually, lately, I've been listening to a lot of old school Nigerian African music uh, from the 80s and the 90s, you know, where I feel it is so much like Bollywood, old music. You know, it had a. It was more about compositions. It was more about the singing, um, and now I think as it's changing, uh, we are. Uh, 
I plan to do a lot more of the old school feel with the new Afrobeat, even over here. When you say the old school, do you mean maybe the high life or do you mean like fellas, which is Afrobeat yes, as opposed yes. to the Afrobeats? Um, any particular? I, mean, the, I, I don't remember the name of those, the female artists that I have been listening to because it's, it's, it's been a lot of them. But yes, I mean, fellas was, was the old school feel. I, I, I still feel that bringing in the old school feel and merging it to, with today's Afrobeat, mm. even in Nigeria, would be so phenomenal. Okay, so we see you in Coca and you're collaborating with the Nigerian artist Ria Sean. What inspired that? And can we expect more collaborations? And if yes, with who? Uh, doing the song with Ria was a conscious decision. It was an Indian song where we featured her. Uh, it was on my record. It is on my record label called Bajau Records, which means play the music. Um, and which I launched, I, I think I'm maybe the first female artist in India to launch a record label. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. I, it was, I dared to do it. Uh, it's not easy, but you know, it's, it's going well. And the reason I took Rhea Sean on that song was just to give India a little bit of a, a feel of another look, another style of a fusion. And yes, there is a whole album that's coming out now in the next month with so many new, um, different, some known, some new uh, Afrobeat and Nigerian artists. It's okay. all produced in my studio in Lagos. Okay. It's composed, written, sung, and the videos. Everything is shot and done in Nigeria. Wow. Wow. Congratulations. Um, that's oh. an amazing thing. Talk about... Um, making this your home, yes. literally work and also um, family. Um, now let's go back still to the music itself. Um, you said there's a bit of um, some of the known faces and some of the less known faces. Do you mind sharing some of the names? Um, what kind of songs can we expect? Give us I, I don't nice want to. Yeah, I think the names are surprises, okay. but I think you will really enjoy the songs. Um, I have kept the songs more Nigerian with a hint of India, a hint of Bollywood style, mm -hmm. but it's a lot more Nigerian, I think. Okay. Um, so Koka was a little bit more Indian with a hint of Nigeria, but the upcoming songs are a lot more Nigerian because the point was to explore more Afrobeat. Okay, now when I was listening to Koka, I'm not very familiar um, with, I know there are different languages in India, so what Indian it was language? Punjabi. Punjabi. North, okay. North. Okay. You know, some people say it's a Hindi, but now I know it's, it's pun Punjabi. Punjabi. So are we expecting more Punjabi in this album? Are we expecting Yoruba, Igbo, Hausa, Ibibio? It's a bit of everything. We have a lot of Hindi. We have, I'm actually si singing in Pigeon too. Okay. Uh, so the next single has me singing a bit in Pigeon. Okay. And uh, it's pure, pure Nigerian music Okay. So style. When the album does drop, um, what are your plans? Because you've set up a record label. Um, when it comes to distribution, are we expecting maybe tours across Nigeria? Are we expecting um, headline shows? Are you taking it beyond Nigeria? I, I, I feel that um, the people of Nigeria have to know me a little bit um, and my music. Once we have the album ready, of course, we will be uh, taking it uh, to different places to, to play, to sort of do the right distribution. The distribution is out of Nigeria. And, uh, and we have a plan. Okay. We'll be back. Okay. <laughs> so a lot of the music coming out that seems to do well these days are the ones that people um, vibe to, yeah. can dance to, <laughs> like, like the coca. <laughs> are, we, are we expecting more of that? Are we going to see maybe a challenge, for example, yes. on TikTok? Yes, the next something? song is, is, is going to be a challenge. I think people will enjoy that challenge because it's a, it's a very interesting song where we have an Indian hook line and then uh, a really, really interesting play. And when is that song coming out? Because you're just uh, putting all the hints in there. When is that song there. coming out, guys? <laughs> <laughs> you're just giving I us all. The Do you song want is ready. Us? The song is ready. The video is ready. Uh, the mix and master is ready. Mm. The, Are the dance steps ready? Do the you want dance to show step us? is ready. Do you I, want to show us something? I can't, but I have to come back and do that because I'd love to promote that song. 
separately and make you dance. Okay, okay. I think my Indian dance, but you know, it's... No, it's, right now the Indian dance is all okay. very, you know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we wish you the best when the song does come out. But um, now I'll move to what it's like, um, your music executive hat, because we've looked at being a performer, singer, songwriter, your musical influences, but now the business side of things. Have you been able to um, continue to overcome the challenges, like you mentioned, being the first Indian to have this record label? Um, the challenge is also being in a new country. How, how are you able to surmount them? I go through uh, many days where I, I cry, I feel down, I feel helpless, I feel frustrated. Uh, but and then the next day comes and I tell myself, no, I can't give up. I will make this happen. I'll, I'll work. I, I just move forward. I work towards things, um, not thinking how and when things will happen for me and in my favor. It's mm. extremely hard for a girl uh, to single-handedly do or everything that I'm doing and I'm trying to do. I've been very brave. So I have to give myself that credit. And that pat on the back. <laughs> yeah. You know, I never used to do that. I used to be an, a very different person that, oh, you know, no, no, I, I don't, I, I don't and I don't. Now I, I, I do say that I have a lot of love and respect for myself. And I think every girl listening to me should always go after her dreams, even if it takes longer. Um, so I want to be that inspiration for all the girls in the world that follow me. Well done. Uh, it might take a little longer, but it shall happen. And you know, you have to love your work and what you're doing and you're and spending your time to yes. embracing the journey, not just the destination. Now you mentioned how the fusion music opened up like a whole new vista in Bollywood. Is that something that you're hoping um, to get into? Do you see maybe your music also coming into um, Nollywood? Because in the past we've seen some Nollywood, Bollywood um, collaborations that have gone to the cinema on streaming platforms. Yes. So is that part of um, the plan? I mean, I feel that I'm, I, I'm still relatively very new in um, in Nigeria. I think the moment people start listening to Kanika Kapoor and all her ocean of music that's coming out in Nigeria, I'm sure that they will give me a chance and, and we will do something in Nollywood. Why not? I'm, I'm so open to doing and exploring uh, new adventures and, and work. So um, I'm sure Nollywood's going to happen. Oh. It, it must. I, I am the bridge between Nigeria and India. So I think, how can you not have a Nollywood movie with, with you know, a song like I, I would sort of put together? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm, and I'm sure people are watching and are listening and they're, they're going to be looking out for the music when it comes out because yeah. um, I think this day and age, because of um, globalization, technology, we can reach a whole new yes. audience. Um, when people listen to your music, um, what's the intentionality behind it? What do you want them to go away with? Um, is it feel good? Is it uh, more reflective? Do you use your music as um, a tool for social change? So to be honest, um, every song that I've ever done is, is ruled by emotion. Mm. There is uh, I'm known for celebration, and but I think that when I did and recorded some of my most famous songs, which were dance, the, some of the greatest dance songs of Bollywood, I was at my lowest and, and emotionally uh, quite a broken person. So for a girl who was um, not all there and happy and excited to be singing and making everyone dance, that was an emotion that connected with different people on different you know, stages of their, their feelings. I mean, I'm not able to explain, but my songs, even if it's a sad song, even if it's a love song, even if, if it's a celebration song, I my connect with people is my emotion, what I put into the song. I don't think about the rest. Mm. I just don't think about the rest of it. I don't think my, my songs are clean. Uh, they always have like an underlying emotional meaning to them. Um, it could be a girl. Uh, a lot of my famous songs and some new songs that are coming are all very girl-centric about how girls feel or want to be 
treated or about how little little girls dream you know and this has come from a place of um, personal experience yes, reflection yes it is my my upbringing uh, in the small town in a uh, with with the dreams that i've grown up with um and experiences of life that i i had during my downfall for a long time so i think it's a lot of those little little bits that i sort of naturally put into my songs without knowing okay yeah. now i'm going to come back to the vibrancy of you know the culture here in lagos whether it's the food or the fashion um the music and all how are you incorporating all those elements because you mentioned that um their your videos were all produced here so are there particular designers that you've collaborated with uh -huh. in terms of the fashion yes i have yes. um yeah spill the i tea. am uh I am I can't even tell you how much love I have for the new uh way of dressing I'm starting to have the the new wardrobe that I have <laughs> uh, I've been exploring all the the fashion in Nigeria I've been uh, wearing a lot of Nigerian designers and every time I post anything wearing a Nigerian designer everyone from india is asking me oh this looks really chic this is very cool we love the print we love this we love the cut where is this where is this from uh i do feel that i need to take the nigerian fashion to india mm. they would love it uh so i've been wearing a lot of lisa falavio um banky banky kuku i've been wearing uh eki kerry i've been uh, there's a lot more that i've been sort of wearing and my videos have a lot of nigerian fashion mm -hmm. So oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. And then what has been like um a standard experience for you as a Nigerian wife as a migrant who has now made this place home? Um can you point to maybe an experience or two? Ha. Huh. What ex what kind of an experience? A good we... one I'd hope. Good one. Up. I mean, like I said, for anyone who moves to a, a new country where she knows almost nobody except her husband and her in-laws. uh from a new home to settling in and understanding what's around me it's been a very pleasant experience okay. my my i think my husband made it very easy for me you oh. know he's been very caring and very nurturing and i think he's been treat my in-laws and my husband they've treated me like this little girl that they are very protective about and uh i think they forget i've grown up which is <laughs> <laughs> but it's very sweet that they do so i i think i've had a great experience um living and and settling in i never feel that i'm away from home or it's become home okay and finally i'll just say um what message do you have to your fans out there i would just like to say that uh, i'm i'm doing beautiful music for for the world for uh, the people of both my countries uh for the people of india for the people of nigeria and just give your niger niger wife a chance give your niger wife a chance and, i love that and uh, i'm here i'm here to stay and and the message is that if i can do it anyone can do it thank you very much kanika kapoor for being our guest on robin minds and all the best with the album and all the singles and the challenges thank you um, thank you for having out. me thank you and this is where we close the show on robin minds my name is isabella adediji have a great afternoon see you next week don't just stand